Hi, welcome to the CCW Safe Podcast. I'm Rob High here in Oklahoma at headquarters, uh, joined by my guest or my partner, Phil Naiman, yeah, in Arizona today. How are you doing, Phil? Doing great. Good morning, everybody. Thanks, brother. And uh, we have a special guest with us today, uh, Paul Sharp. Uh, Paul has been uh, in law enforcement. He is a martial arts practitioner. He's taught combatives to police officers. He's a, he's a high level shooter. He's done a little bit of everything. So Paul, man, thank you so much for joining us. Where are you at today? I'm out in Boise in uh, Boise, Idaho. So I appreciate you guys taking time to talk to me. Very nice. Um, Paul, if you give us a little bit, um, kind of how you got your start and when you got into law enforcement and kind of your career path since then. Sure. So I started in law enforcement in 1997 in, in a Chicagoland, a town in Chicagoland area. It's about a medium sized city. So around 200,000 people, uh, decent sized police force, a lot of opportunities to do a lot of different things there. And so I was able to take advantage of that early on. I uh, went through the academy, got out of the academy, came back, went to work, you know, like everybody does. And then there was an opportunity for what they call the resident officer program, which is when you live in an at-risk neighborhood mm -hmm. and you're expected to bring the services of the city to that area to improve life for the residents. Some friends, some guys in the department that had kind of taken me under the wing, they encouraged me to put in for that. They're like, listen, you'll never get it. You're still on probation, but it shows interest in doing things. And so it's good for your career path. So I put in for it and I got it. And so uh, it kind of took off from there. And I uh, had a lot of experience working in neighborhoods, community oriented policing um, in the kind of the, the original Peel model or some, I know it's controversial, but the broken window model as well, where we just were constantly proactive, constantly looking for to keep things in order in a, I guess, a manner in which I would want to live or my kids, I would want my kids to live. And so we did our best to do that for the neighborhood. I spent about four years, four and a half years doing that. And um, I'm really proud of the work that we did there as a community, as a, just a, a collection of people coming together to get things done in a neighborhood that was previously had actually the, the month that I moved into that neighborhood to begin work, they had had a triple homicide, drug deal, kind of retribution type thing had gone down. There have been numerous shootings, stabbings. It was pretty intense in that neighborhood for a little bit. I was the subject of a couple attempts as well on, on my life and, you know, on the, the house that I lived in, they tried to try to set it on fire. And uh, I guess that was my welcome to the neighborhood. So it was a it was an interesting time. It taught me a lot and taught me a lot about people as well. And then from there, I was able to try it for the SWAT team, became a member of the SWAT team and worked in that capacity for about 14 years, I believe. Got to do a lot of really cool things in that capacity, including work undercover for several years. And then I'm during that time, I was also able to become the lead pistol instructor for my agency, um, became involved in the test and evaluation of red dots for pistols. I think that was around 2012, 2013, the very first generation of the Trijicon RMRs. Um, and so was involved in that kind of stuff for a while. And then uh, towards the end of my career, came out and became a regular patrol officer and working night shift and just really enjoyed my time there. Those guys are the heroes of uh, law enforcement. Night shift gets no love, but night shift's a tough shift to work. And um, really enjoyed my time doing that. And those things, you know, during that time, I'd also met Craig Douglas and we began working together and kind of testing and evaluating, researching, developing, the material that we were teaching others as well as our fellow law enforcement officers and how that could apply to regular folks, particularly 
the stuff I learned as a resident officer, where a lot of times I was on my own, there were not that guys weren't going to back me up, but just a lot of times things happen in such a way, evolve in such a way that you you might have a pistol on you and a radio and that's it because somebody was banging on your door at two in the morning about their neighbor trying to kill his wife or something and so you just grab what you can and get out the door and go take care of business and so I learned a lot about being on my own for however long I'm going to be on my own and and then also working undercover those things you know how people interact, how a criminal mindset operates, those kind of things really informed the stuff that I began to teach as well as having somebody like Craig to bounce things off of and talk to. We both were working undercover at the same time. And so being able to talk to each other and develop, kind of codify the things that later became muck and what Craig teaches is muck and then I, I teach as well, you know, with his, with his permission and guidance and being able to bring those things out to regular folks and, and develop them and, and have it in a way that it can be taught was really important. So that was kind of my career through that phase. And then after I retired, I went to work for a friend who was, became a chief of a really small town, I think. I think it's literally like 4,000 people in that town. Uh, it was tiny, you know, uh, literally one stoplight. And uh, so to go from where I was working to that was a bit of a culture shock, but it was an amazing experience. He's a phenomenal chief. And just to work in an environment like that was a big change. And as strange as it sounds, the things that I learned working as a resident officer in an at-risk neighborhood and working undercover really applied working in a small town. Because yeah. again, you're on your own, there's no backup. A lot of times I'd be the only officer working and there's still things that happen, just not at the frequency, but that doesn't change the stakes or the risk when it does happen. And you're just, man, you're on your own out there. <laughs> it's, yeah. you know, big props to guys that work in small towns. I think the average police department in the United States is like 35 people, 35 officers sworn, uh, something like that. I'd have to look it up. It's been a while since I researched that, but you know, hats off to those guys, man. That's a tough gig to be out there doing that. But that's kind of my background on that side of things and what's led me to where I'm at today and what I teach. You know, one of the things you brought up there, uh, one of my original hunting partners name was Dick Phillips. He was the uh, mountain car uh, office sheriff for LA County. Okay. So lots of Indians, one sheriff. And, um, you know, he explained to me one time, he's like, I am 45 minutes away from backup. So oh, yeah. I, I have to do everything and do it perfectly at all times. So, and he was, he was awesome. You know, he's passed on now, but, uh, I understand exactly. Or even the sheriffs that are on Catalina, even farther away from backup. So yeah, it's, it's, stuff. It, it's a tough gig. You know, I, I when I first got out there and was helping him out, you know, there was an accident. It's a pretty bad accident. And I remember thinking, you know, I'll just uh, get back in the car, secure the scene and get, get on the radio and let them know to send traffic out here to investigate this. And then I realized there is no traffic division. It's, it's man, you know, like, hold on, hang on, wait a second. You know, so I have to, it's yours from start to finish, from the second that ball hits the bat plays in motion and you are the entire outfield infield everything you got to play it all you, you know, know and hats off to those guys like we were in laramie hunting and we had a medical emergency the ranch owner was having a very hard time and we're 45 minutes in the hospital so we're coming in hot and they're sending out the ambulance the other way to meet us on the highway we get there and he's a big guy so it takes both guys from the ambulance to deal with him the sheriff coolest guy I ever saw man he he as they're dealing with him he runs to their ambulance pulls out their gurney wheels it up um, they look at him and go, we're going to need to both be in the back with this guy. He locks his squad car on the side of highway 80 hops in the ambulance and drives him in. I'm like that, you know, that doesn't happen in multi-agency yeah. no. in big city stuff, but no, I love to see it. Yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. So, yeah, so that was, that's kind of my journey and what led me to here. And, you know, it's been, it's been an interesting ride. I wouldn't trade it for anything. 
you know, the ups, the downs, the positives and negatives of all. It's like I tell people about jujitsu. I don't know who I would be without it because I've always done it in some form or another. Even when I was a little kid starting to wrestle at six years old, um, to me, that all just fed into where I am now. And I don't know who I'd be without any of this stuff because I've never not had it. But I'm really glad and happy with who I am as a result. And I don't know who I'd be if I hadn't had a 22-year career in law enforcement. I have no idea where I'd end up or where I'd be. Craig Douglas jokes around all the time that you either end up on one, guys like us end up on one side or the other of the law. That's how it goes usually, how we're wired. Maybe I'd been in prison or killed by somebody, but I'm really happy with who I am and who those experiences have formed me into being and create, you know, what it's created. You know, this is who I am, and it's a result of all those things, good, bad, and indifferent. You know, so I'm thankful. You know, that that resident officer thing was kind of a national program. You know, yes. They, they help young officers with housing and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I really wish that was still in place for the, for the very reasons you were touching on. Um, Number one, it, it put a human face to law enforcement for the people that lived around you. Mm -hmm. But the biggest takeaway for me was, you know, you, especially now, you get kids with no life experiences and they run out there and they're answering calls and think they're really doing the thing. And, you know, you got this neighborhood that's pretty rough over here. And so they just get to the mindset that everybody in that, in that neighborhood is a bad guy. Yes. The very worst neighborhoods around are still 85% good people. They're just yes. scared to death. Mm -hmm. So, so to be able to interact and have that day to day, you know, we got, we got young kids here that, that spend their entire shift locked in the confines of their safe car, driving around, just responding to calls. Yeah. Um, Man, the the best way to serve is to to park that car on the corner and walk down the block and talk to folks that are outside. Yeah, yeah, just walk around and talk. You will get so much information, so many different ways you can help folks. Yeah, um, I I remember going through. So in our our agency was our chief was kind of one of the forerunners of that stuff. He started it in the early nineties. Now, you know, there's always arguments about who started what, you know, and I recall having we would have news crews come from other towns, from other states to follow us around and watch our video, our interactions with people. And it was always kind of weird because this is just what I do every day, you know, and now I have somebody kind of video on it. It makes you weird. Like, you, you know how you get when you're on camera, you just like start acting weird, not acting like yourself. But. I, I remember, you know, talking to folks and I, I would talk to these kids and um, there's a, one of the courses they sent me to, to train me up for this program. They talked about the, the Alaskan, the natives in Alaskan, Alaska had a term for the police that was basically men without legs because they never saw them walk. They were always in a car driving around. And so it was like a slang term. And I remember the first couple of times I got out and walked around the neighborhood because I rarely drove my squad car. I would just walk out my front door, call myself in service and walk around the neighborhood. Also, at the time, I was competing in MMA and jujitsu and all that stuff. So I'm doing my road work through the neighborhood where I live. So I'm running out there, you know, and doing everything out just in the area. And it took a little while, but then people start warming up to you. And they start talking to you and telling you, and you realize their concerns aren't really that different than mine. And also exactly like you said, Rob, 85, maybe even higher of these folks, I'm never interacting with because they're not the ones that are getting in trouble. They're not the ones causing the trouble, but they are definitely impacted by what's going on. You know, I remember a guy telling me he has his kids sleep, you know, on the floor because it has that fake brick front on the apartment building and so that way if there's a drive-by or something steps off outside with these gangbangers are selling dope out there 
something steps off, there's rounds coming towards his house, they're not going to hit his kids. If his kids sleep in a bed, they're going to be just high enough that the rounds will come through the window and maybe hit his kids. And I remember that just broke my heart, you know? Yeah, we, we, we worked lots of those where you've had a kid that is, is killed or really yeah. seriously inside the home, that absolute innocent, yeah. completely unattached victims. So yeah, it's easy to say, right? Like it's easy to say this whole neighborhood is just a bunch of idiots, you know, a bunch of whatever, but that's not the case, you know, and you're never going to learn that if you don't get out of that car, start interacting with these people. If, if you think you're, you're going to learn everything you need to know about police work and, and how to affect change, like real permanent change, in a neighborhood, you're never going to do it by just going in and arresting everybody and writing citations. And there's a time and place for that. I did plenty of that. You know, there's a time and place to, you know, you go and stand next to, in our area, we had the 13s and 14s in my neighborhood, 13s and 14s. So Norteños and Serenos hated each other, always gangbanging. And then we had Vice Lords and Gangster Disciples, you know, blue and red had those guys always getting into it and all the little sub factions of those guys. And then we had one Asian gang that was pretty notorious, La Posse. And, you know, I would walk up to them. People would tell me, you know, we have to remember they got to live there. People will say, man, why don't they do more? Why don't they call 911? Why don't they tell us who the bad guys are? Why don't they tell us who we need to be watching? (laughs) Things like that. And it's like, man, you got, they got to live there. Like you're going to drive out of that neighborhood and go back to your house or your home or wherever, but they're still living there and they're going to answer for having a conversation with you or their kids are going to answer. Yeah. And so you have to remember that stuff. So you learn to kind of read between the lines when people are talking to you. And so I remember, you know, we, we would do stuff. We would go out there. Uh, we would find where their, their corner is, where they're slinging. And we'd stand there and I'd just stand right next to them. They're like, what are you doing? I'm like, what are you doing? You know, and they're like, they get mad and they'd step off the sidewalk to walk across the street. I'm like, hey, come on back. They're like, I don't have to come back to you. I said, yeah, you do. They're like, whoa, you know, and they know the law. Like these kids are 14, 15. They know probable cause and all that stuff. They're like, what's your probable cause? I'm like, that's not a crosswalk, Junior. Come on back and get your citation for jaywalking, you know? (laughs) And so then uh, you call them back and, you know, and then like, any good bad guy they don't keep track of their citations and they don't keep track of stuff like that and then you get a warrant for them for failure to appear and then you you hand that warrant off to the gang unit or somebody like that and they can pop them off when they're hot you know they'll have something on them they'll have a gun on them or they'll have dope on them or something you know they'll have something going on when that warrant gets served and they'll end up catching a bigger case and then yeah there's so there's time and place for that but there's also a time and place for well, what are we doing to make sure these little shorties have something to do other than stand around in a park and get in trouble? Or what role models are we providing for these guys other than this dude that just pulled out a stack of cash and flashed it in front of this 12-year-old? Yeah. Now this 12-year-old's like, look, man, I haven't eaten lunch. My last meal was Friday at school lunch. It's Sunday. He's not going to eat again unless he shoplifts. He's not going to eat again until Monday morning at breakfast at school. That kid needs a role model. That kid needs some other things in his life to show him opportunity other than, well, this dude over here just sold like 15 of these little bags of rock and look at all the money he's got and he's going to go eat a meal. Yes. So, you know, that's the other side of it. Like you have to have the enforcement side where you could start clearing out these guys that are, that are just bad, the 15%, clear them out, you know, but then you have to have things in place for the other guys coming up where they see there's another way. There's another thing. And so you have to have those after school programs, you have to have the during in school programs, you have to have all kinds of stuff going on. And that's, I wish more officers would just understand they could play a role in that. They could, you can do both. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, like you can, you, you can, yeah, you could come out there, you know, jacked and strong and ready to split heads, 
of bad guys and put, you know, protect the good people from the bad, you 100% can do that. You also can be that same life-size action figure looking dude who goes to the basketball court with these kids or football or baseball or something and shows a positive example, positive influence to these guys that there's another way. Like if you don't like the police, if you hate the way the police treat your neighborhood, well, why aren't you the police? Yeah. Right? Why can't you could be the police, man? You could be like like Craig joked around, right? Like one side or the other, we're gonna end up there. Yes. That's the path. Why don't you come to this side and affect change or become somebody who affects change? I had a lot of those kids came back to see me, you know, after they were grown. They ended up in the military, you know, a lot of them became Marines and Army. And so they they went they went a path where they changed the direction of their life, you know, but until somebody shows up that says, hey, look, you can do something different, they're gonna, they're just gonna go with what they see. Yeah. Right. Cause you know, it's like that old thing about the I had a friend, he wrote a really cool song way back. He's like, but the it basically is like you're writing a gospel every day with your actions, you know. So like that's the only, that's the only gospel a lot of people are gonna read. They're not gonna open a Bible, they're gonna, but they're gonna watch your life. And that's going to be the gospel they read. So these younger guys in law enforcement, it's like, man, look, you are, you are showing folks a different way. Like you, you, you can, we can argue back and forth all day about the role of the police and society's perception of the police and the role of the police, or you could just show them, you know, you could just take action, do it, show them like, look, I'm, I'm going to come in here. Don't make me have to do my job. Don't make me have to arrest you, right? But at the same time, if you want to change, if you want to do something different, I'm the man. I will find a pay. I will find something for you. I will find. I will help you find that path. You know that. I think that's the role. I think that's the original. Maybe that's a, a modern version of Peel's principles and his vision for community-oriented policing because it never. A lot of guys associate community-oriented policing with handing out teddy bears and ice cream cones. And... That ain't it. Yeah, that's not all of it. <laughs> you know, you, know you, you mentioned earlier how, how young you were when you first became involved with wrestling and then you yeah. moved, moved into other, other forms of martial arts. Um, when you started wrestling, were you immediately successful? No. No, I was terrible. <laughs> I was really terrible. Um, it, it gave me an outlet. It gave me something to do. And my wrestling coaches were really cool about it. They saw my effort. They saw my drive. You know, uh, I was I was diagnosed at an early age. They called it hyperactive disorder back then, it's ADHD. So I was diagnosed with that. Our town area that I grew up in I think the county maybe has 13,000 people so all the kids because I was so out of control and crazy uh, they put me in the LD BD learning disability behavior disability classes well those classes man what they did was they brought everybody from the whole county to one classroom so that was it you know so I'm in this class I'm in kindergarten first grade I was in first grade there's kids in there from eighth grade that are giant. Yeah. They're like on the four year eighth grade program. Like this he was the apogee. He was the apogee, <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 This kid's like 16. Like you shouldn't be here, man. And so they would come around and just go through our lunches and go through, take whatever they wanted. And we just had to sit there and take it. The teacher was absent. He just checked out, not paying attention. And finally we had this one teacher come in, student teacher. I wish I could remember her name. But I was so little and she just is like, listen, I've been reading about what's going on with you. You have dyslexia and you have this hyperactive thing. Well, the thing is with with the hyperactive thing is you can you can hyper focus. You can you can focus really well if you try and your dyslexia, you just drop off the first letter. So, you know, so instead of seeing your full name, I would just see OB. When I'm reading, for some reason, my brain just drops that letter off. And she said, I remember her saying, like, words are just sentences are just patterns. 
once you figure out the pattern, you'll know what they're saying. And so the way we're going to do this is since you can focus, we're going to go to the library every day and get a book and you're going to read that book. So I read a book a day for like six months, the whole entire school year. I read a book a day. I came back the next year. They tested me and I was, they bounced me out. They're like, this kid can read. He can go, you know? So they put me in, thank God. They put me in regular classes. And, uh, but what my point with that is I was able to bring that to wrestling. I was able to bring that drive and that focus. And so I think my coaches recognize that, that even though I wasn't the best at it, even though I had the hard, I had a hard time turning on that kill switch, you know, I just wanted to have fun and rough house. Um, they recognized that I was a good training partner and a good worker. And so they would just put me out there and let me go and thank, thank God every day for that. You know, those guys just, they didn't only keep you if you were a winner and maybe too the fact that we were in a small area. So they had to keep anybody they could keep in there. That was one that they needed anybody, Isn't that awesome? Yeah. <laughs> anybody's willing to go through the grind of a wrestling practice yeah. and, and show up again and again and again, you know, they, they probably need to keep in a small town, a small area like that. So you know, one, one of the things that, uh, that Rob was looking at was you don't show up at an MA. Well, some people do, they show up as an MA gym thinking they can win they get in the ring and then they get trounced. Right. But <laughs> You know, you don't have that expectation, but in the shooting world, a lot of times somebody might take a level one class and get the certificate and it's like, okay, now I'm good. You know, I, and so how do you, how do you merge the levels of training required for proper self-defense? As, as far as blending everything together? Well, I think, you know, what, just as if becoming a black belt in jujitsu took 10 or 12 years, right? right. Um, that of showing up, sweating, getting rolled up um, into little sweaty balls and then trying it over again the next day. You know, becoming proficient with your firearm is not something that you just take your CCW test and start walking around carrying uh -huh. your gun. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. and the other part I think I'd like to ask you about would be gun retention because i saw an egregious example this week that i wanted to bring up but go ahead so i think one of the main things we have to look at shooting as a martial art it is yeah absolutely a martial art and mm, martial art yeah and so folks that think that you could do a a simple course and be ready to go at a high level, that's the equivalent of some guy walking into a boxing gym, hitting the bag for a few minutes, maybe having a trainer hold mitts for him, and eight hours later feeling like they're ready to get it on. Like, we're going to put you in a ring with that guy right there who's about to make his pro debut, and let's see how you do. And most folks have no idea how bad that would go. They think that, you know, kind of like that, that tar the onion where they say you know the average male overestimates his ability to fight by four thousand percent you know and come to find <laughs> out just seeing red and going off wasn't enough and it's the same with shooting i think <clears throat> we in the shooting community fall victim to what we see in the first responder community which is nobody got hurt everything went okay so we must be good there's no need to change anything. There's no need to debrief harshly and, and develop a training program coming out of this that will allow this to never happen again, because in their mind, nothing really happened. And they never figure out that the only reason nothing happened is because either whatever God you believe in smiled on you that day, lady luck kissed you right on the mouth, something happened beyond your control, that allowed it to go your way and and luck and hope are not a plan and so moving forward we need to examine harshly everything that led us to this point and never let that happen again and most ccw folks we know right the data is out there that most incidents that involve a gun don't involve shooting right 
So just the presence of the gun is enough to make most people back down and back off because either they decided that today's not worth it to them or they were legitimately scared off. And so do you want to roll the dice on that? that you, and, and so people walk away from that with this false sense of we were good enough. And, and there's been a few trainers in the training community that have talked a lot about how, well, how much training do you really need? Because most people that defend themselves are untrained when they defend themselves. And that always boggles my mind because having faced that mentality for 22 years in law enforcement, where guys were like, well, nothing bad happened. What's the big deal? Like, there's a lot. There's a lot that could have gone wrong. And the only reason it didn't go wrong is because we got super lucky, you know, and I don't want to depend on that moving forward. What if, what if, you know, now let's what if and build contingencies based on that. And so what happens with CCW guys is they take that course. Now they're carrying a gun. Should they have to present the gun to somebody, they think that's going to be enough. They think they're going to be good to go. They think I'm just going to just let them see that I got a gun or I'm going to point the gun at them and that's going to be the end of it. And what they fail to understand is that sometimes, I think it was Herschel Davis, Herschel Davis said at one time in a course I took from him at the site in Illinois, he said, sometimes the first indication that you're in a gunfight is around hitting you in the chest. And you still got to fight. But do you know how to do that? Do you know how to actually fight with the gun? Or do you just know what you learned in your eight hours or 16 hours of CCW training that really didn't equip you for a whole lot other than what we would call weapon familiarization? You figured out which end to point that way. You know, right. <laughs> well, how, how many videos have we seen? I mean, these body cams have showed all this evidence. One, two, three officers, guns drawn on a bad guy, and he still comes. Yeah, right? you don't care. Right. Yeah, and that's the thing. One of the, one of the first, my first um, operation as a SWAT guy, you know, you're being kind of babysat. You have your SWAT daddy, you know, watching out, making sure you're not going to screw up too bad. So we did our thing. We're all done. House is locked down. My... I'm standing in a room, so I get left in a room with two little kids who are watching TV, playing video games at like four in the morning, you know, and so I'm standing there and I'm in this room with these kids while my team leader comes by. He's like, hey, two in the room, right? I'm like, yes, sir, two juveniles. And, you know, are they, they good to go? So I turn around to the kids. And I go, are you guys good to go? And then one kid's like, are you guys okay? You need anything? The one kid's like, if you could step over that way a little bit, I can't see the TV. Now, my point with that is these kids were in a house that just got flashbanged from every single direction, just had a bunch of cops running through the house with ARs, screaming and hollering and knocking people down and stuff crashing and banging and doors getting knocked off. These guys are three and five, if I recall correctly, sitting up playing video games through this whole chaotic scene and their only concern is I'm standing in the way of their TV. They can't keep, they can't play their game because I'm in the way. Yeah, that's Wednesday. Yeah. Now, when that kid's 18 and you point a gun at him, do you think he cares? He just had a bunch of SWAT dudes blow his house up, pointing guns at everybody. And yeah. it's not even rattled. It's just another day. Probably, he was probably thankful that it wasn't rival drug dealers because they would have hurt him. You know, they would have killed him maybe or hurt him or tormented him, tortured him to try to find out where the stash is. And so when that kid's 18, if I really think I'm going to point a gun at that kid and he's going to be phased, I'm delusional. And so a lot of CCW guys don't understand you pointing a gun at this guy. And we just talked about it with Craig Douglas at his ECQC course here. You know, you have these guys do this over stylized reholstering and they love to say reholstering is an administrative function. You, if you still have to fight, why would you have, why would you put the gun away? I don't know. Maybe because that four year old is now 18. You just pointed a gun at him and he doesn't care and he has no visible weapons on his body and he's still walking at you. Do you want the gun between you? Do you want to fight that kid for that gun? Or would you rather put that thing away as quickly as possible, as safely as possible, and get your hands up and get ready for what's coming your way? And so a lot of CCW guys, 
I see this disconnect where they don't understand this is a martial art from start to finish. I want to be able to outthink, out talk, and if necessary, outfight anybody I run into with anything, anywhere, anytime. That means a gun, a chair, the neighbor's cat. I don't care, man. If I pick it up, I'm going to work with it and I'm going to knock the crap out of them. And you need, they need to have that confidence they can do that. And, and a lot of the guys that I see concealed carry and active in this community aren't practicing their martial art in that way. Right. This is a martial art start to finish. The second you strap that gun on, all you did was just change the stakes of your martial art. Yes. And not even really change the stakes as much as just gave you, you gave you an option when the stakes go there. You know, Tom Givens likes to say, it's not the odds, it's the stakes. So, you know, you putting the gun on, all that did was just increase your odds, put, put the odds a little more in your favor when the stakes are bad. But it's still the same. You've got to be able to control that thing. You've got to be able to fight with it. And just because you pointed it at them doesn't mean you get to use it. And having that in your hand, well, now we're going to fight over it. Because right. I'm not going to let you have that back. Yeah. Right. So here's here's uh, things that I've seen now. I'm in Arizona, right? Open carry state, constitutional carry. Love it. 100% support it. But again, it's responsibility. I was at a, uh, I was at a restaurant the other night and these guys were hanging out talking and stuff and guys open carrying. One guy had a open carry flop, flop holster over the top. Um, with a swivel. So it was like what a, maybe what a cop, a motorcycle cop might wear with a flap holster. I'm like, what, why are you even bothering? The second guy I saw later on had a Beretta PX4 in an open top leather holster, no retention on his hip. And, and, you know, there is no way in the crowded, the crowd that we were in, if there was a bad guy, he's going to retain that there's, it's like a bucket holster and, uh, sitting on top of his right hip. Now, if it was concealed, nobody would know it, but you know, the guys like to open carry, which is great, but without a retention on the holster, you're put setting yourself up for a potential fatality that involves you and your gun. You know, Rob and I have talked about that before where guys are walking around with a, um, 1911 in the back of their pants and you're at a grocery store you know he's yeah, he's just one, saw that he, he's one one can of beans one pound can of beans away from getting smacked in the side of the head and his gun gone without him even knowing it so mm -hmm. you know i think practicing gun retention can you give us a little bit about how you guys go about that yeah um that's a great point and literally i was thinking of that when you said it we just went to silver city which is an old ghost town out in the mountains here in Idaho. My wife and I went up there to just visit and see it. It's like 6,000 plus feet of elevation, beautiful area. I'm a, I'm a history nut nerd, you know? And so just going out there, but while we're there, Jill says, look at that. I look over, this guy's got some sort of nylon holster with one of the, one of the belt loops looped up and clipped around his belt and the gun sitting in his back pocket. I don't know. I couldn't get close enough to him to see it. And I really didn't want to get close enough uh, to see it. Cause I'm afraid stupid would rub off on me, but it just, it, sometimes stupid's contagious. So I didn't want to get that close, but I'm just looking at, I'm going, you have no retention, passive retention on that pistol. And not to judge harshly, but I'm going to also take the leap that you don't have any active retention either. If I walked over and grabbed that, you couldn't stop me or anybody else here that wanted that gun because you just don't look like you put the work in. And well, so it made me think I, about and, it. And how many videos do we see uh, of prison yards where the bad guys are practicing that? Oh, yeah. it away. Yeah, when I was a resident officer, the kids used to love to pretend they were up on the wall getting patted down. They'd see me walking around, you know, they're kind of like amping you up, you know, a little. They want to jack with you a little. And they'd see me walking through the park and they're up against the fence, you know, on the park and they're pretending to pat each other down and doing all the like, these some basically like a sambo roll into a knee bar. 
you know, they're basically Sambo rolling forward and coming up underneath of the kid, patting them down and knocking them down and then running away. And they're like, what do you think about that, Sharp? I'm like, that's pretty cool, man. Don't ever do it for real, you know. But, you know, these guys practice that stuff. They study that stuff. There's been, there's been courtroom uh, subpoenas. There's been Safari Land. One of their holsters was brought into court, right? You remember that, where the, the Aryan Brotherhood subpoenaed that thing and had them go through a whole demonstration of how that holster works to prove their point, which was our guy could have never got the gun out of way out of out anyway, so you have to drop that charge. And what it really was was just a fishing mission to figure out how that holster worked. Yes. And so what we do is I try to encourage people to carry appendix. I know it's a little bit controversial for some still. I encourage having your weapons forward of your hips because it's easier for me to monitor where that thing is. Idaho is an open carry, constitutional carry state. And so if folks will carry open, I'm okay with that. Like I'm, I have nothing to worry from a guy who's open carrying. He's not a threat. He's not a criminal. So I don't get into all that crap, but what I would like to see them do though, is have a decent holster. You know, um, I work with the tier one concealed guy. So most of my stuff's concealment that I use, but have a solid holster first off that retains that thing. If it's going to be open, have some sort of passive retention device on that. Uh, the tier one guys make one, which is similar to the SLS, but it's, you know, for concealed carry guys, um, you can have that hood there and a retention device that locks it in. Safari Land makes the GLS. I don't know if you guys are fans of that one or not. I'm kind of on the fence on that holster. Um, but that also, your middle finger hits it, it has a retention device. It's, you know, the open, the holster's open, but it has a retention device if you're going to open carry on the hip. But what I prefer to see is people move that forward a little bit. So rather than at the three, it's more at the 230. So it's not quite getting in the way of your movement, but it's close enough to your elbow or you can keep your elbow on top of the gun or, or monitoring the position of the gun. When they're in a crowd, when they're, um, I think we talked about this at S12, Rob, when I, when I went from being undercover, SWAT, all that stuff to patrol, I was hyper vigilant, super paranoid. Because yes. for the first time in a long time, I'm walking around with my gun out in the open. And I just, this, anytime anybody got close to me, near me, you know, walked up behind me, like on a bar fight call or something like that, I just, I constantly had my arm just sitting right on that thing. And I just was like, I don't want to be one of those guys that gets his gun taken. And so I think more folks need from a passive um, or just from a preventative mindset, you need to have some carry position where your forearm from this, from here to here is covering the butt of that pistol, the grip of that gun. And you don't have to be overt and crazy about it. You can kind of do the Jack Benny, you know, the old school combatives thing, you know, interview position, whatever, where your arm is covering that thing and you're maintaining awareness. I think people assume that because you have the gun, nobody's going to try to take it. Right. And yet we've seen a whole lot of video now that shows just the opposite. Yep. You know, what I just saw one, it's an old one. Somehow I missed it. People send me stuff all the time <laughs> on that stuff. And somehow I missed this one, but it's a guy in a, a gas station. He's standing there ordering. And he's got the gun stuffed in his back pocket. Have you guys seen that one? The guy just comes up behind him, grabs it and runs out the door. And he turns around and it's weird. You can see his brain doesn't know what to do because right. he's handed money to the clerk. So he's waiting for his change and his gun just got taken and he's running out the door. So he's, he takes like a couple stutter steps back and forth between, do I get my change or do I go chase the guy that took my gun? You know, it just, it was kind of funny to see him just have that meltdown. Like it had never occurred to him that what if, and what do go, I do? And then, if. and then he chooses, I'm going to go chase the guy who now has my loaded weapon in his hand and is <laughs> yeah. obviously a felon. Yeah. Yes. Unhanded. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, what are you going to do, man? Hit him with that bag of chips you just bought? Like, I don't think it's going to work. Well, if they're spicy Doritos, maybe get them in his eyes. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, you know,
you know, on those, on those training topics. Um, and I don't, I don't say this to be discouraging. Um, I say this absolutely to encourage <clears throat> we're kind of in the wrestling community for a long time the number that's been thrown around to make something to where it's an autonomic response you have to think about it you just go mm-hmm. ten thousand repetitions yeah. um, it's a hundred reps a day for a hundred days and that's then, all it is yeah that technique then becomes you it becomes a part of you mm-hmm. um, now, after you've spent a lifetime of doing those things, um, you know, we can bring Paul out and put him in the dojo with us and go, hey, have you ever seen this? And he says, no, we run through the mechanics of it, uh, fundamentals of whatever the technique is. He'll pick that up. He'll grasp that much, much faster than Joe Average because he's got all of those other reps in and he knows how to, how to make his body do those things. Um, but on the, on the firearm arm side of that, you know, how many times do we have guys that I, I walk in, I unload my gun, I make everything safe, there's no bullets anywhere around, strap on my holster, and I just practice my presentation. I just practice drawing and coming out of the holster. Nothing else. Just come out and right back in. Come out, right back in. Um, or same thing, I'm just going to, I'm going to dry fire. And I dry fire with a purpose. Um, I take a sight picture. I look at everything else and I snap the trigger through, reset the trigger, back up, get my sight picture, snap. Yeah. Um, and I can't do that. You know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not JJ Ricasa. I'm not Julie Golub. I'm not, I'm not doing that for an hour every single day because this is what I do for a profession. Right. But if I do that four or five minutes, And I just built that into my daily habit where that guy is, he he understands his trigger movement. He understands how to prep his trigger. Um, You know, I I got slack to there. Anything further, I'm I'm going to, I'm going to activate this thing and and it's going to go into working mode. Um, Just, just practice till your trigger finger gets tired. That's about four minutes. (laughs) It doesn't take long. It doesn't take long. And, and you can have a, just a down and dirty training regimen that only takes 30 minutes a day. Yeah. Very easy. You really can, you know, you could set a timer and I'm going to, I'm going to work on this specific task for one week for pistol. Yes. So for one, for one week, I'm going to work what we call the horizontal line of presentation, right? So I'm going to go from where my hands collect the gun out to a sight picture, snap the trigger, bring it back in. I'm going to press out, don't press the trigger. It's a don't shoot now. So finger comes off, come back in. Say that. Say those words to yourself. I can shoot. Press. Come back out. Reset. Right. If we're drive back out. Oh, don't shoot now. Right. And then how do I come back in and holster quickly and get my hands up? You could work on that for five minutes. The next five minutes, you could work on an impact weapon, which was also covers the improvised weapon because every impact weapon out there or every improvised weapon out there rather is probably going to be an impact weapon, something you can pick up and hit people. You rarely are you going to find somebody leaving a knife laying around unless you're in the kitchen. So, and then you can work the next five minutes, edge weapons, work your edge weapons. You can choose for one week to focus on defense, one week to focus on offense. Now your fourth, which now you're into your 20 minutes, right? So I've worked pistol impact, improvise and edge weapons. Now my fourth, 20 minute or five minute session, I'm going to work on some stand up. I'm going to move around shadow box or shadow wrestle standing. And then my last five minutes, which would put me at the 25 minute mark for skill development, I'm going to work on something on the ground. I'm going to work Ichikomi, you know, for me, because I'm a grappler heavy kind of guy, I'm going to work on some sort of sequence on the ground. This is my whatever I'm going to do, right? If you don't know anything about grappling, work on shrimps, what we call shrimping, bridging, or technical stand-up. Those three movements are the basis of every single escape and every form of wrestling and grappling known to man. If you can do those three things and chain them together relentlessly, you'll get out. You'll be hard to hold down. And then the last five minutes, which puts me at 30 minutes, I'll do some sort of physical fitness. The Canadian Air Force back in the 50s or 60s came up with a program called the uh, 5BX. 
five basic exercises, one minute a piece. So one minute of pull-ups, one minute of push-ups, one minute of squats, one minute of lunges, and one minute of sit-ups or some sort of core exercise. That's five minutes. Do that every day for the, the rest of this year, and then let's see what you look like. Let's see how you move. Let's see how familiar you are. And like Rob said, then I can bring you in and I can say, hey, man, today we're going to work on the elbow pin to not let your gun come out. Just pin your elbow to your body. Keep your hands in and don't let me get your gun out. And we're going to do a five minute round where all I'm going to try to do is take you down and get your gun off of you and make you eat your own gun. And all you got to do is keep that elbow pinned in here. Keep your hands here. Keep your head safe. Not get knocked out. And be surprised that person having put in that work will have the movement patterns and body awareness to be able to quickly adapt to whatever we plug in. Those are the guys that you can just simply say, hey, do this. And within two reps, they're doing it. And a lot of people think it's some extensive thing. But like Rob said, my judo coach did a little informal study. And the number he came to was 3,500 reps of a movement will get you to the next belt level of that movement. So let's say I'm working my Tai Toshi, Tai Toshi over and over again, right? If I do 3,500 reps with intensity, meaning complete mental focus, if I do 3,500 reps of that movement, I will have, let's say I'm at, uh, in Jiu-Jitsu, we use Jiu-Jitsu belts, right? So if I'm at a blue belt level, my Tai Toshi will be purple belt level or brown belt level, even though the rest of my skill set might not be. And so when we start doing things from that perspective, like, listen, I might not have a J.J. Rikaza run and gun game, but I will have a J.J. Rikaza press out and acquire the sights skill level game with one year of consistent practice on that thing. And what for me as a concealed carry guy, what is more important, the ability to negotiate a stage not that that's not important and not that you shouldn't learn how to do that. The ability to negotiate a stage and maximize points on a stage. Mm, that's, I'd be happy if I had a blue belt level understanding of that, right? But what I do want a black belt level understanding of is the ability to see a threat, come out and have those sights perfectly aligned, drive out and break the shot quickly right. or not break the shot quickly and be able to transition to the next thing. And the way to get there is the path I just lined out for you. Just train a few things, a couple hundred times. You know, that's a, like Rob said, it's a hundred reps a day for a hundred days. The gym's never closed when you train at your house. And nice. so there's no excuses. You it's, know, uh, when, when I want to end on this one training tip, you said defensive use for edge weapons, right? So mm -hmm. my training tip for that is wind sprints. Make sure you can outrun somebody <laughs> if you don't have your gun. Heck yeah. Wind sprints and yeah. And climbing, be able to climb. <laughs> hey, Paul, um, man, I thank you so much for jumping on with us today. Um, before we close out, I know that you got uh, a new online training program coming mm -hmm. up. Um, yeah. Tell us really quickly about that. Yeah. So we're going to do a six week basic challenge for all, all my concealed carry folks and, and guys that are in this lifestyle. Six weeks, basically what I just lined out each week, we're going to do a different thing. It's free. So once we launch it, there's no reason not to do it. The gym is your home. Your, your training area is your home. Everything's designed for the guy who doesn't have a lot of time. It's 30 minutes a day. You can go longer, but 30 minutes minimum a day, and you can improve your skill over the course of the next six weeks. And then, of course, there will be paid stuff, right? I got to pay the bills. I got, I got to eat, man. And uh, so there's, uh, there'll be modules based on that. I have the MDOC series, the multidisciplinary optimization courses. Those you can find on Straight Bless Gym University. And then also I have my jiu-jitsu for self-defense. You can find that on uh, BJJ Fanatics. But the stuff that we're going to be launching – in conjunction with the six week challenge will be modules online. Once a week, we're going to get together on a zoom call and answer questions, coach each other, help each other out, help each other progress and just try to build a tribe of multidisciplinary badassery, you know, guys that just want guys and gals that just want to get after it at all levels and be dangerous to bad people. My, my mission is to make good people dangerous to bad people. It'll make the world safer. Very good. Very good. How do these guys get hooked up and, and join in on that? 
Yeah, so the easiest way to find me is just through Instagram. So that's where we're doing everything right now. So it's my name, Paul Sharp, SBG. And you can find me on Instagram through that and just link up with me there. Thanks, brother. Yeah. Thank you so much for jumping on. Um, yeah, thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. Man, we got to get you out here to Oklahoma City. I'd really like to get you out here and, and get in the gym and train a little bit and then run out to the range. So, man, I'd love it. Let's do it. So, Phil, dude, have a great week. Uh, you too, guys. Thank you very much, Paul. Yeah, thank you. Again, Take care. As always, uh, if you guys have any questions, comments, or concerns, you can reach me directly at rob at ccw.com. Thank you, guys. We'll see you all next week. God bless.